Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Avishag Danieli. You can call me Abby. I'm a director of product management at Gardecor. And I'm Dave Klein, senior director of engineering and architecture for Gardecor. So what we're going to talk about now is what makes us unique. So we talked a little bit about the company. We talked a little bit about what happens behind the scenes, how we designed our solution behind the scenes. Now let's talk about your part. You would be using Gardecor as a user, what it would actually look like and the fundamentals of that. We have a couple of live demos here and we're going to be showing you what that would actually look like uh, should you be using Gardecor. So first of all, again, what led us to build our solution is fundamentals that are that will make a security and segmentation project as simple and fast as possible. So for this, we have defined the following. You have to have unmatched visibility, and we're actually going to see this. We're going to see that we can provide you, again, a single pane of glass to visualize your whole data center from your legacy system still holding you back all the way to the cloud and to cloud and containers. Yes? Um, when you say single pane of glass, do you mean visibility for your product? Or do you mean like I would be connecting a lot of different things into it? Or what exactly are you getting at? I'm going to show you. It's pretty cool. So you're actually going to see that um, in, I think, maybe two, three minutes. So we'll show you that. OK. So we provide you unmatched visibility, and we're going to visualize this for you. Mm -hmm. And again, when I say single pane of glass, I actually mean we can show you your whole data center from the data that we collect. And you'll actually see this in a couple of minutes. And we also provide flexible grouping, which means an ability to give context to your assets, which actually means that you will be able to visualize your data center in the way that you think or speak about your data center. And to on top of all of this, we've actually taken and created several flexible policy models, whitelist, blacklist, and composite, which actually enable us, enables us, coupled with the rest of the solution, to answer any segmentation use case simultaneously. And we'll show you that as well. So visibility, what are the goals of a good visibility solution or our visibility solution? So first of all, to map application dependencies. You have to understand what's happening in your data center to be able to take control of what's happening in your data center. If you don't understand or visualize what's going on, it's much harder to take action and make data-driven decisions. So we start with mapping application dependencies. And then the second goal was, of course, to visualize everything from a human lens. So it's not a log of all your connections, right? Because that's something that you have to sift through and it's work. We actually enable you to visualize the data center from a single pane of glass and be able to see that in a human lens with lots of context. You'll see that in a sec. So what made us, what drove us forward with the solution? First, it was analyze all flow metadata, which actually means that we see every connection, be it a successful connection, be it a failed connection, because you have existing firewalls that are blocking your connections, be it a blocked connection, which is something that we actually see, that we have actually blocked. We collect all this information with flow metadata, and we'll touch on, on that metadata in a second, to visualize everything that's happening. So it's not a deep packet inspection, inspection solution, right? It doesn't have large overhead. It's a very small agent, which we've discussed before. So we're able to analyze all the flow metadata and store and display this historically. So you can actually choose to visualize your data center and view your data center with the last 15 minutes of data. But you can also go and choose two days, three months ago, or a <coughs> month, a year ago. We can store the data as far back as you want. And you can actually use this, again, to make data-driven decisions. But also, we actually see our customers using our visibility tool for other use cases. It can be for forensics, for example, or to troubleshoot when you create policies or troubleshoot something in the network. And we will actually uh, see that later as well. So in comparison to, for example, two weeks of data that you can take that are fixed weeks of visual data, you can actually choose a month-long a view of a specific application to make a data-driven decision based on that. And we provide as much context as possible. And when I say that, again, we provide information about the process level, about fully qualified domains. You will actually see what user executed each process and what the user identity that is logged onto the system actually is. And we also provide, for example, the command line that was used to execute this process. So we go all the way down to that information. And then when you want to make a decision, should I add this connection to my policy, you have all the context that is relevant to make a data-driven decision. And we present you full dependency graph, which means anything in the data center. And we'll see that in a minute. 
On top of that, we add flexible grouping for context. So labeling. So we started with mapping everything, and then we add a context, which means you need to map and then understand what you see. And not only should you understand it, but you should also be able to visualize your data center in the way that you speak of your data center. What does this actually mean? So for example, if you have a concept of zones within your environments, we actually enable you to view your data center in a hierarchical view of zones within your uh, different environments. We also do this for the classic view, which is roles within applications, within environments, and we will see this in a minute. But the most important part here is it's completely customizable. So you don't only get to add context of environments, application, roles. You can add any information that you want from geographical location to the owner of the server so that you'll be able to know who to contact when creating this policy, who the group in charge of this application actually is. So it's completely customizable and we've decided to view to show a hierarchical view which actually again, <coughs> we'll touch on that later, enables us to support any segmentation use case simultaneously. So Dave, it's all yours. Great, good morning everyone. So what we have on the screen here is a hybrid cloud data center environment. And we talked about having unmatched visibility and looking at things through a human lens. And a human lens changes depending on your role. You might want to think, see things in a different hierarchy, and we have the ability to do that. So first things first, I want to show you the underlying architectures that we have here. We actually have a number of platforms. So I click on platforms. It's now organized by platforms. So you actually are looking at a data center with bare metal, VMware, OpenShift, as well as AWS. So this is truly a hybrid cloud environment. Another thing to think about, we talk about uh, human lenses. I may be a compliance officer, so I might be looking at PCI. So I may want to sort this infrastructure by what is PCI and needs to be ring fenced and protected from the non-PCI environment. Or for my first example of the day, what I'm going to do is be a production manager of an application called Billing I will click on this, and I know that my billing application is critical to my business, and that uh, it has several tiers that we want to protect between the tiers of the application, as well as ring fence it from what talks to it. So what? Apologies for this. It's a visually challenging. So we're looking at in the client. Is this like when you first log in? Is this deep into it? What are we actually? What part of the client? The the, the policy we're looking. The thing we're looking at. So right now, what you're looking at are labels that make up different hierarchies. And the beauty of the way that we do this is flexible because we know that you may be a compliance officer and want to see one rule uh, and one uh, series of hierarchies to make a policy where someone else may want a different way to look at it and make so policy. You're trying to make your administrative console be a multi-use console so a compliance officer can use it. Maybe yes. the, the C-level role has a use for it. Exactly. A security person has exactly. it. And so looking at this billing application, what I see is a hybrid cloud environment. And back to uh, your question earlier about is this our data or someone else's data, the idea is it's both. So we have here in the center uh, a billing web service uh, application. Uh, it's actually Green Unicorn, a very nice web service. And you see you have orchestration details that are provided by OpenShift and Kubernetes. So all that information comes from OpenShift and Kubernetes. To the north, I have a legacy uh, VMware environment. You get the VMware, uh, VMware uh, orchestration details as well, as well as the interconnects. And to the south, we have a Postgres database uh, that also interacts. So what you're seeing here is the orchestration data provided by the various platforms in a seamless single pane of glass so we can understand the interdependencies of that application. Furthermore, we see what we're interested in ring fencing. You see you have the user environment which comes through the infrastructure through a proxy, and we're gonna talk about this in great detail. So can each of those dots represent an agent that, we've de that has been deployed? Each of those dots is a workload. So in some cases where you see process level visibility, you have an agent. In cases, if you saw an IP address and a node, it's a layer four representation. Yeah, sorry. So it's both. With no, these no. eyes, it's, it's tough to see that far. <laughs> Excellent. So now I'm going to show you a really cool way that we have to create policies really quickly. We have a thing called a policy wizard. So click on the policy wizard here, 
and I'm looking inside my application and what talks to it. So first things first, you see some green lines. That tells me we have some policies already in play, as well as between the tiers of the application and also between the OpenShift router where the customers come in through. And what's important to understand is when you use the policy wizard, it automatically creates this map and understands the interdependencies down to the process layer. This is critical in making the smallest attack service possible. It automatically knows that, for example, if you know Green Unicorn is a Python process, this is the Green Unicorn talking to the MongoDB to the north. This is, uh, again, the Green Unicorn talking to the Postgres uh, databases to the south. And finally, we have our users who sit behind an HA proxy over here. We see that we're in blocking mode, which means this is fully implemented and enforcing. But a lot of people start with alert mode in case they might miss something first, and then uh, move it to block afterwards. And that shows you how easy it is to use our policy wizard to come up with a policy for micro-segmentation as well as ring fencing. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. So when you're talking about setting policy, this sounds very manual. How well, much automation is there in the policy, and how do you know what's good versus what's bad in some form of automation? So if I have a large environment, I may not know what I have in my environment. If you guys just say, hey, we're just going to take what you have and say that's all good, no, I can no, guarantee no. you it's not all no, good. No, no, no. <laughs> we don't do that, and I, I agree with you. We, and, and what's important here is... What you see here in these, these labels of different colors, there's been some time put together, and these labels can come from CMDB, can come from the various orchestration platforms, and we use them to sort through and create context. So the first thing you do is you create context uh, with the application, and then the idea, when you get to this point where you have the policy wizard, it comes up and shows you what it's talking, and then you look at it and say, that's correct, and that kind of thing. I don't want to look at it. I want you to tell me it's bad. For example, if I'm using SMB v1, that's probably not a very good flow to have anywhere. So we actually have a wonderful example touching exactly on that we'll in that. the yeah, next demo. Really good so we'll show you exactly that. Thanks All for right. raising that. Before we get to that one, yeah. Got a platform question from Breno on Twitter. You mentioned AIX on IBM. Do you guys support LPARs within AIX? So um, I'll have to check on that and get back to you. Okay. Um, but let's talk about that after the session. Right. But we, okay. we wonderful. Do, we do have an AIX agent. Yeah a Solaris agent, an HPUX agent. So the Solaris agent uses containers, Solaris containers? So again, we'll touch on that after the session. Okay, so going back to uh, what we've done, what we've actually seen Dave show us at the moment, what we've actually seen him do is use our visibility, again, single pane of glass for the whole data center to create policies for an application. And as you've seen, it's a data-driven decision. We provide you information down to process level. And with integrations, we can also show you information from orchestration, et cetera. We've seen that for containers as well as uh, a virtual environment. But what, we, what he actually did was he was actually showing us a policy model that is a whitelist policy model. Because what you saw there at the bottom was blocking rules and then a list of allow rules on top of that blocking, right? That permit the different connections down to process level between source and destination for the connections of this application to ring fence it and for micro segmentation. So this takes me to our next part of the solution, fundamental part of our solution, which is a flexible policy model. So we don't only support whitelist, which is really important for the cases that we've just seen, but we also provide a blacklist model, which will help with the case of the SMB that we're going to touch on in a minute, and a composite policy model. So taking all of this together, we actually understand that whitelist only is not enough in the world of real data centers today. So we've taken that and we've added blacklist and some composite. And Flex and what we've added on top of that is the flexible, non-restrictive labels that we've just seen in the live demo to actually give context to what you see on the map. And along with the hierarchical view that you've seen before, this actually enables us to address any segmentation use case and reach a very fast and reduce the time to policy. And we've actually had a customer come to us and say that they were trying to segment their Swift application using VLANs for about nine months. And then using something like this, it actually reduces it to one month of work. So it's a huge difference, no downtime, and we're actually going to touch on that in a minute. And when talking about the different segmentation use cases and how our flexible policy model coupled with labeling and strong visibility enables us to touch on any segmentation use case, let's talk a little bit about what those are. 
right? So a lot of our customers, so the list that you see here is a list of what we usually recommend our customers to do, but this list was actually derived from what we see our customers doing, right? We learn from our customers and we are able to actually then go ahead and continue to, uh, to help. So this is usually a flow of what our customers to do. The, it will do these points, but customers can actually intercept this list at any moment and, per, and perhaps choose to do only one and three or only um, two and five. So basically what you can see here is a list that our customers growth go through. So first of all, we start with general IT hygiene, or this is what we see all of our customers using, which is our blacklist model. And this means, for example, in the case of uh, SMB that you want to protect because it's an insecure, it's an unsecure uh, protocol, what you want to do is actually be able to block it. So we can block Telnet, for example, at, across the whole environment or SMB down to process level. And Dave will show us a very nice example in a moment. But can you go also to the version? Because uh, his question was about uh, the version of SMB, not uh, the protocol itself, not the port itself. But so the version, like, we can actually do this down to the process. So you can actually lock this down to, down to the processes communi communicating over this protocol. For example, for a web server, you, can, you may want to close all uh, TLS. Uh. In my demo, I'll actually okay, I'll okay. get into that. Yeah. That's a very good question yeah. to get into the demo. And we'll actually visualize this in yeah, a minute. I'll show you what I'm, yeah. So we start with general IT hygiene rules for general quick security value from day one, blocking communication you don't want to have. And then on top of that, we add an ability to, to actually secure the infrastructure services, which actually means let's separate, for example, my data center from my user space, my data center from my IOTs, so we can do that. And then you dive into the data center and you start separating environments, you start segmenting environments. You can segment your production from your development and move forward to ring fencing your critical applications, your digital crown jewels within your specific environment. So we do that, for example, for Swift and other uh, examples as well, such as regulated environments. And then you can dive into your specific critical applications that you want to micro segment at this moment and you can micro segment them as well which means separating the different roles right how databases within this application can communicate for example with the web tier which is what we've seen in the previous demo so Looking at all of this, again, just to mention, this is what we usually see our customers doing. This is a general flow. But again, customers can intercept this at any moment and start at point two, move to point, to point four, et cetera. That is the beauty of the product. We enable you to be flexible enough to cover every segmentation use case and do that consecutively, simultaneously. So Dave, why don't you show us Excellent. that demo that we've mentioned? So by customers, when they start, look to handle the low hanging fruit. What gets the biggest bang for the buck? And the kind of stuff that we talked about, vulnerable protocols, out of date protocols, are essential in taking care of that. So we're gonna show you the power of using a blacklist to do just that. So the, we talked about TFTP, we talked about other vulnerable protocols. FTP is probably the worst. And it's also very difficult in traditional methodology to take care of since it can use dynamic higher ports. So the beauty of Gardacore is we allow you to handle this easily. So what you see on the screen is a traditional layer four port-based rule. Port 20, port 21. There's no acknowledgement of what version of the software it is uh, and the like. And the key is instead of doing this by port, we're gonna do it by process. So to simply put, all you have to do is go over here and you see you have any to production. I'm gonna say I'm looking for any communications with FTPD in any place that it it, it comes out and I'm going to remove the ports because the beauty here is we don't care about the ports we'll look for FTPD conversations anywhere in the environment and basically all we have to do is hit publish changes and we're good to go now as far as the individual versions of the, the software I'm going to wait to my next uh, demo I'm going to show you mm -hmm. I'm going to show you where we, we actually do that we actually okay. can say we can now because for example uh, this. for say SSH uh, right is the same but you want to block uh, right. version right. one uh, exactly so thanks Dave you're welcome um, so basically what Dave showed us in really two minutes right was how you can easily create a policy in Gardacore to black to block FTP, non-secure FTP across the whole environment with a single rule. Now, the value of this is A, it takes you a few seconds, 
right? And the second value of this is actually we were able to secure FTP across the whole high range of ports that it can communicate on with a single rule, right? A single block rule on process level across the whole infrastructure because that is what we cover down to process level on any operating system, right? Linux, Windows, we cover it down to process level across the whole infra. Yes. So what happens if someone attempts to start FTP? What does the user see? So the blocking rule that we actually just created was anybody trying to communicate with production over FTP will be blocked. Oh, I understand so, they won't be able to communicate, but if I'm an admin yes. and I don't know that this rule exists, I try to start FTP, what do I see? You'll be blocked. Actually, in my, my next demo, it's going to be secure shell. Uh, you'll see exactly what happens. I'm going exactly. to show the end user experience. We have the end wait user. For that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I'll just want to take that and touch on that point to, to help clarify how, actually, how we actually make it simple, right? So again, you saw a simple rule. But imagine if we didn't have a blacklist and was only a whitelist solution. Right? So in order to be able to block FTP, you would actually have to whitelist all the right communication, the communication that you want to, uh, that you want to permit in the data center in production environments, only to be able to then block FTP. Right? So the overhead here takes a long time. Right? The work there takes a long time. You have to whitelist everything in production only to be able to block FTP, where with our blacklist model, we can give you value from day one. Now, touching on that, I actually have a more a more, let's say, a little bit more complex example uh, that we actually see uh, all of our customers using today. And the first thing is that you want to actually enable uh, administrative protocols to communicate with your environment only if they come from jump boxes, from terminal servers, right? So what you actually want to do is to block anything coming directly to your production environment over these administrative ports and only enable things if they come from the jump box. So looking at Gardecore, where we've already learned how flex about flexible labeling and we've learned about uh, how easy our blacklist model works, we can actually see that you can create a label for jump boxes and a label for production. So you need two labels. And then you can actually create two simple rules. One that says production jump boxes to production environment over port 22 allow, while everything else to production over port 22 block. We'll show you in a minute how we do that with process level in the next demo. But this is a very simple rule to do with the composite and blacklist model that we provide. Time to value is one day, or if you're Dave, then one minute. Uh, and rules to manage is two. Now, if you look at a whitelist only model, you would have to label, yes. Okay, so at a whitelist only model, you would have to label everything, and then time to value would be months, and rules would be thousands. Now, I'm good. We're going to talk about a specific example that I think would be really is that is really relevant to all of our customers. And one of them in our latest customer advisory board told us that this specific feature actually reduces their costs on terminal and jump boxes by 60%. So, what are we going to do now? We're actually going to add another layer to this jump box use case and show you how user identity rules actually enable us to reduce the cost of jump boxes. Because what we're going to do is we're going to show you how two contractors, Andy and Doug. Andy from 3D Analytics, who needs access to our accounting application, and Doug from DevOps and Sons, who needs to manage the DMS application, how they, both of them, can use a sp the same jump box with, that, with configurations and user identity to be able to access only their relevant applications. And this is what Dave is going to show us now. Thank you, Avishag. So by far, beyond looking for protocols you don't want in the environment, the biggest thing all my customers do is handle remote access. This is important, especially today when you have so many contractors, distributors, vendors, and people that need to be in your environment, need to be in that data center and the cloud, but need access to the right thing. And at the same time, I'm going to show you how we, we talk about specific processes and versions and things like that. So I have a map on the screen. I'm in my infrastructure environment. I have my jump boxes, and I'm, I'm specifically talking about my Windows jump boxes. And what we have is, is two contractors, uh, a gentleman named Andy, who is 3D Analytics, and Doug, who's with DevOps and Sons. And there's two putty processes here. Well, Andy is responsible for the accounting application. As we see here, as we click on putty, you get the, the putty executable, where it's coming from, the hash value, uh, as well as the full command line used. So as far as if this were a case like there was a certain version of, of uh, SSHD that was vulnerable, we would know by hash, we would use your vulnerability manager to use our API set 
to be able to put in labels to say these are vulnerable, go ahead and remove them from the environment easily with a blacklist. So, but in this situation here, it's not that the process is vulnerable, it's that Andy really should only be in accounting, but what we see here, he has an open transaction to the accounting application and the DMS, which is Doug's responsibility, not his. To the south, we have another putty process. As we can see here, we have all the information about it and see that it is, in fact, Doug. And Doug should be talking to DMS, but he also has an open thing with accounting. So talking about the end user experience that you mentioned earlier and also showing the power of how quickly we can enforce, what I'm going to do here is we actually have a little eye into both Andy and Doug's remote desktop session. And we're going to start with Andy, who should be in accounting, and we can see He's working fine in accounting, but he also has a session open with DMS. How about you show us this is really Andy? Oh, that's a good point. We should show that too. So I click the start button and we see that in fact, yes, this is Andy. So very cool. And then we have Doug and I'll click on that button again. And we see in the right hand corner, it is Doug. And Doug, who should not be in accounting, can get to accounting and can get to the web services. So going back over to our console, I'm going to open up the traditional policy view. And you see, again, in traditional layer 4 port-based solutions, you're kind of stuck on the port only, right? This doesn't give you any opportunity to, to, to do identity, nor if someone's crafty and using a non-standard port to protect yourself. So we're going to show you how we do it with Gardecore. I'm going to duplicate these rules. And the first thing I'm going to say is, OK, so as far as Andy is concerned, we'll go to uh, Active Directory. And Andy is from 3D Analytics. So we'll lock it down to that AD group. On top of that, uh, in production, what uh, he's supposed to be able to get to is, in fact, is the accounting application. Let me put that in. And we want to lock this down to referring to SSHD, wherever it occurs. And we're going to remove that port because, again, if someone's crafty, they can change the port, no problem. All right. And the second one, our contractor, uh, is going to be Doug. So we go again to directory services. And we know he's from uh, DevOps and Sons. We're going to go into uh, production and say he could only get to to DMS application. You got to remove production. Thank you. No problem. And again, SSHD, wherever it occurs. Do you have a way to automate the setting of all these rules if I have a group and I want to set up this, this type of setup? Of course. So everything you see here, basically one of the things that I mentioned before is our product is the API. And we integrate with policy management solutions. So you can either use the UI, either the policy wizard we've seen before, or the more traditional view that we've just seen. Or you can, uh, well, you can automate it in any way you see fit. So if I don't have a good policy manager, which is incredibly hard to have anyways, I have classification problems. My CMDB is inaccurate, which is Pretty typical of most enterprises. Very typical. How do you help me get over that policy problem? OK. So one of the things that we have, for example, is we provide you with flexible labeling mechanisms through the system. We actually are not showing this today, but if you want, we can show that later. Just right. we're, running we're running pretty, running pretty low on time. Low on time. So I'm back on Andy's remote desktop. And so now if I look and say uh, Andy should be able to get into the accounting application, still fine. And again, on the DMS application, an existing connection is already terminated. It's instant. It's not minutes, not hours. It's instant. So now, and even for existing connections. So, so since it's based on the process, will you have to within the daemon configure it to only accept a V2 connection for SSH for its existence? So in this situation, I'm just showing SSH, but I could do a blacklist that would, would allow one version versus another. But in this yeah. case here, it's, it's a more simple version of it. And I'll also show you that if he tries to get back in, again, he's in charge of accounting, not DMS. If you go to DMS, 
we see, he, again, he's blocked. If I go over to Doug, who should be not in accounting, we see he instantly lost connectivity. If I go over to DMS, still fine and dandy. I can't believe I used fine and dandy in a presentation. I'll live. <laughs> and again, no access to the accounting. Let's just show that service. this is Doug. All right. And show it's Doug again. Yeah. We could see it's Doug. So going back over to the console, we could see in a nice graphical representation, we have, of course, our friend Andy up north. He now is connected to his accounting application as he should be. And clicking on uh, DMS, we see he's been blocked instantly. And vice versa for our buddy Doug. He's no longer in the accounting application. We see he's blocked. And he is allowed to get to his DMS as originally he could do. So real quick, because I know you're, you're towards the end. So my thoughts are, OK, I've purchased the product. Obviously, the next step is installing the agents. Agents are now installed. When does the mapping now, how long until the mapping is now a useful thing so I can see what's actually happening? Okay, wonderful. So um, I'll give you a very quick answer because we're really running low on time. But what we usually do is we don't demand, like we said, we're completely flexible. So you don't have to label your whole environment to start working, right? You can start with your what you're focusing on now. If, you're, if your goal is segmenting a specific application, let's just label that one and work on that one. So we can either get those labels by integrations or we can use the system with things that we said that we'll show you uh, later because we're running off. Uh, yeah, running obviously off. the concern, and this happens with everyone, there's stuff in my network I know I don't know about. So it's really, it's really the question of, you know, okay, right. when does it come from a security person? I can now see, hey, there's stuff there that is running, it shouldn't be running. So we see that a lot, and one of the values, for example, of, uh, of rule management with blacklists is the ability to quarantine things like, those, like that, that aren't labels, et cetera. So there, there are different ways to manage this, but we'll talk about that later. Um, I just had a question kind of related to that, but um, could you use this for like um, IT kind of um, target operating kind of, not models, but like the direction? Because I know... I use Splunk as an example a lot, so I apologize, not in the same sense, but it's, um, they have a setup where you can kind of understand what's going on in your network. By the sounds of it, it's basically you guys offer that as well as you kind of understand the, the flow, but also more of the, um, like, in the future, we're building out this, and so we need to consider these things. Would you consider that a valid use case for this? So one of the use cases of our visibility is, in fact, forensics and troubleshooting, et cetera. So there are and companies migrations. that use that. And, mig and migration. You see what you currently have and what you're looking to do. So exactly. Do you, nice. So do you have application fingerprinting for encrypted traffic and the like? So um, there, there are various... This is taking us a little bit off topic, yeah. so let's talk about that later. Uh, we'll, we'll hang around for all these and questions. because we're an agent, we're below the encryption level. Hmm. Let's check out the next slide there. So, yeah. Since we're running low on time, I'm okay. going to show you Second. one more demo. I should go back so what we're going to show you now is actually a demo around fully qualified domain names and the value of that and how easily and flexibly we can actually secure the data center with that. Excellent. So the key here is when we look at updates, I'm going to use an update example for, for anything from GitHub, Windows updates, or one of your Linux distributions. Just as enterprises are using dynamic, auto-scalable IP address ranges to do their things, so the update services. In a previous life, uh, it used to be very uh, big a hassle for me to keep things up to date if I had static lists. So the beauty is being able to make policy by domain is really critical. And what I'm going to do to do that is look at a development group that's working on a new application that they're putting into deployment. And I see here they have internet destinations. I'm going to right click on here and filter to see what they're doing. And I see on the right hand side a bunch of IP addresses. And what I'm going to do is open this here. And what I see is that that environment is talking to a number of uh, GitHub addresses because again, there's multiples. Uh, they're talking to Ubuntu in a couple of ways, and there's also a suspicious domain I would like them not to talk to. If I open up the dev environment, I see they're working on the org portal. One more click, I see it's a three-tier application. And depending on what tier it is, there's different things that they need. Looking at the web services, I see they use GitHub and also Ubuntu for distribution updates, as well as that suspicious domain that I wish they wouldn't be going to. The other two tiers, we have Load Balancer and Database, both do NTP time updates to Ubuntu. 
So what I'm going to do here is go ahead and basically go into, go into this and create a policy that is effective. So traditionally, at port level, you kind of have problems doing this in an effective manner. But I'm going to show you how easy it is to do with domains. I'm going to duplicate this rule here. And this first section, we see that the web services need to reach both GitHub and Ubuntu. So I'm going to go in here real quickly and change this from uh, development environment org portal. I'm going to change this to actually just cover those web services app part of the application. Okay. And apply. And instead of giving access to the whole internet, I'm going to clear that. I'm going to say they need access to GitHub. I don't have to worry about uh, port. And here we said that the web services, as well as the other two tiers, need to get to Ubuntu. So I'm going to go here. So this is a beautiful representation of what we can do. Not only by doing fully qualified domain name do we avoid the hassle of having static IP addresses, but the key here is you see these colors? So I've been able to show that because we show a hierarchical view, that I'm able to use two rules to do something that would take a lot more rules to do otherwise. We cover in this way here, the web services can talk to GitHub and Ubuntu, and then everything else can talk to Ubuntu. So we submit. Okay, now we have submitted it. Now I'm gonna go to the web portal portion of that application. And I'm going to do a wget to GitHub. I get in fine. Now I'm going to go to that one suspicious domain that I wish they were not going to. And they're blocked. It's that easy. Going back to my interface. We can see, and this is the network log, which is, you know, we've seen map representations before. This is the network log version of that. You can see right here, we're allowing that web portal to get to GitHub but we blocked it going to the suspicious domain. So it shows uh, that we were being effective. And that's it. Wonderful, thanks Dave. So I'll just sum this up for us. Basically, what we've done here is we've created a solution that is fast and simple to help you move forward with your segmentation and micro-segmentation projects. So again, our fundamental is give you the best visibility out there to be able to understand everything that is happening in your data center from a single pane of glass across your whole data center to be able to understand everything that is happening. And we do this by doing the hard work for you. We consume these large amounts of data to be able to represent them visually in a manner that is easy to understand for any user and to be able to visualize your data center in the way that you think or speak about your data center. And we do this, again, supporting any environment and multiple flexible policy models, which actually means that we are able to support any segmentation use case simultaneously. And basically, our goal was to make your life simpler with, for security teams, for application teams, for infrastructure teams, and to move forward a faster segmentation project. Thank you.